Sure, you all have been in those moments or <laughs> Zoom and all of that. So, um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sarah Riff. I'm the assistant director for the Latin American Caribbean and Adult Studies Program, and I'm delighted to see so many people came today um, to see our uh, graduate Tinker Name Summer Field Research graduate recipients talk about the kind of outcomes of the research that they conducted. I'm going to try very hard to pronounce your name correctly. It's Tanadi Diaz Lopez, which I think was not correct. But um, so today, um, Tanadi is going to present Puerto Rican artists and their fight for Black representation. And uh, this presentation is a summary about the arts in Puerto Rico, Blackness, the discourse of El Mestiza, Mestizaje, Mestizaje, and the key findings of her research. Uh, her research interests are the Black identity in Puerto Rican artworks, Black women in Puerto Rican artwork, decolonization in Puerto Rican artworks through the Black figure. She plans to study the influence of African culture in Puerto Rican paintings and raise awareness of the African legacy through artworks. So I will turn it over to you so you can present. Muchas gracias, Sara, por la introducción. Deseo agradecer a cada uno de ustedes por estar presente aquí. Eh, deseo extender mi agradecimiento a Lassi por organizar este panel. Finalmente, deseo reconocer el generoso apoyo de la Fundación Tinker Nate y los fondos de Nate que hicieron posible este proyecto de investigación durante el mes de verano. Antes de comenzar mi presentación, Puerto Rican Artists Under Fight for Black Representation, deseo dar un pequeño trasfondo a que viene mi propósito de mi investigación en Puerto Rico. Recientemente también una maestría titulada Puerto Rico Nere, A Space for Exploring Blackness in Puerto Rican Society. En esta tesis describo mi experiencia visitando la exhibición Puerto Rico Negre, realizada en el Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico, durante el 20 de octubre de 2023 hasta el 30 de octubre de 2024, que recientemente se terminó. En la misma reflexiona críticamente el objetivo de la exhibición, analizó tres artistas, Ramón Bullerín, Javier Cardona y Adriana Parrilla, y cómo estos trabajos son presentados para crear un diálogo sobre la negritud. Luego, considero cómo estos artistas abordan el discurso de la cultura visual sobre la negritud y participan con la audiencia o interactúan con ella. Finalizo el ensayo considerando los problemas y los límites de la exhibición abordando el tema sobre el racismo institucional. Pues de acuerdo a mis investigaciones y mis impresiones, tomando como punto de partida la tesis de maestría, mi viaje a Puerto Rico es una extensión de descubrir cómo los artistas puertorriqueños desafían el borrado colonial de la representación negra en Puerto Rico. Estoy interesada en cómo el discurso colonial en Puerto Rico sobre el mestizaje, es decir, la idea de la identidad de Puerto Rico, que se basa en tres razas primordialmente indígena, europea por parte de los españoles y africana, que viven todo en armonía, y su relación con el colonialismo influencia la representación negra en la isla a través del arte. Por tal razón, visité lugares clubes como la Universidad de Puerto Rico en Calle, el Centro Avanzado de Puerto Rico y el Caribe, y los museos para comprender cómo los artistas navegan, enfrentan y se entrelazan con estos temas. Pues en ello, tuve unos varios objetivos presentes para esta investigación. Era cómo se define oficialmente el arte puertorriqueño, hay otras tendencias o corrientes artísticas en contra del discurso del mestizaje. ¿Cuáles son las contribuciones que los artistas negros han aportado al arte puertorriqueño? ¿Cuáles son los impactos de la comunidad negra en las artes? Por eso dividí mi trabajo en dos partes. La primera parte fue una investigación, visité dos lugares. El primero fue el Centro de Estudios Avanzados de Puerto Rico y el Caribe, así que leí varias tesis sobre el arte en Puerto Rico, este, del siglo XIX hasta el presente. También leí tesis sobre este, algunos académicos que han escrito sobre las artes negras en Puerto Rico. En segundo lugar fue la Universidad de Puerto Rico en Calle, pues leí libros sobre este, académicos que han publicado recientemente sobre la negritud y también sobre la pedagogía y las artes con relación al tema de la negritud en Puerto Rico. La segunda parte fue más caso de estudio, en otras palabras, visitar museos, ya sea ver las exhibiciones temporeras o permanentes en Puerto Rico. El principal objetivo de mis visitas fue aprender las estructuras de las exhibiciones, cómo los curadores, las curadoras, los curadores presentan la negritud en las exhibiciones y cuántos trabajos 
hay de los afrodescendientes. Algunos objetivos fueron satisfactorios, incluyendo cuántas exhibiciones se concentraban en el tema de la negritud y cómo los artistas resisten el estereotipo de las personas negras en Puerto Rico. Visité varios lugares claves como San Juan, Caguas, Loisa y Humacao. Eh, para solo mencionar unos ejemplos, está el Museo de las Américas, el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo, el Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico. En Caguas visité más como museos locales, ya sea el Museo de Caguas, Museo de Arte Populares. Y finalmente visité dos pueblos claves sobre que creaban espacios para que los artistas afrodescendientes pudieran este, presentar sus obras o su obra artística, ya sea Casado Afro y Casado Silvana en Humacao y en Loís. Estas son varias fotos que de una de las presentaciones que visité. Está José Campechino Pinto, que es colección arquidiócesis de San Juan. En esta presentación mostraban al artista José Campechino, el primer artista negro de Puerto Rico y el primero en promocionar pues, el arte de Puerto Rico. Mayormente sus obras se enfatizaban en temas religiosos, ya sean retratos de los obispos, este, imágenes a la Virgen María y también algunos bocetos sobre San Juan o la estructura de San Juan. A su mano derecha está otra exhibición que visité, que es el colectivo Máscara de Puerto Rico, que, es, que fue en Caguas, de la misma, pues crea, este, mostraba la evolución sobre el arte de crear las máscaras para que crea o que daba la construcción del mestizaje criollo. En su mano izquierda también visité una el Museo de las Américas, que es la travesía Crossings de Ignacio Ollo. En esta se especializaba en mostrar la obra de la artista afro, afro puertorriqueña Irma Arroyo de sus 40 años de travesía. Así que mayormente este, este servicio mostraba toda su obra, la proyección desde que comenzó hasta el presente. En la mano derecha mostré el Ateneo puertorriqueño, que es el lugar donde durante los siglos XIX y XX los artistas puertorriqueño exponía su obra o era el lugar donde ellos podían exponer su obra y el arte. En su mano izquierda hay otra foto de sobre otras exhibiciones que visité, como Santo de Palo de Puerto Rico, que es una exhibición permanente de la obra tallada de los santos, las artes populares. Y en esta de la derecha, pues me gusta esta foto y la, y la coloqué aquí, ya que es una de las pocas versiones que se muestran pues proyección pues la raza negra en Puerto Rico, mayormente con la Virgen de la Monserrate y el Niño Jesús. Eh, ¿Cuáles fueron las conclusiones o los hallazgos, o los principales hallazgos de esta investigación? Pues que la relación entre arte y colonialismo es evidente cuando se define la identidad, la identidad puertorriqueña sobre el tema de la negritud en la isla. En otras palabras, ¿cómo se define un puertorriqueño? ¿Cuál es la negritud? ¿Qué significa ser negro en Puerto Rico? Desde el siglo XIX siempre ha existido en Puerto Rico movimientos artísticos en contra del discurso de mestizaje. No obstante, sus historias y trabajos han sido olvidados o borrados por el apoyo de la élite a través del movimiento costumbrista. Y a través de las investigaciones que he leído, pues siempre ha existido movimiento en contra del discurso de mestizaje, de la unión de la generación de mestizaje, no obstante, porque la falta de conocimiento, la falta de acceso, pues nunca se han conocido a estas personas. No hay documentos oficiales que relaten las contribuciones del arte negro en Puerto Rico o diversidad de las artes. Solo se han encontrado pocos estudios pertinentes que cubren estos temas. A pesar de la gran influencia que los artistas negros o de afrodescendentes han tenido en Puerto Rico, no hay mucha información sobre ellos, ya sea a través de las tallas de los santos, este, la forma de hablar de este, los movimientos sociológicos a través de las artes. En años recientes, vamos a pues, darle una fecha esa este, data, 2015 en hacia adelante, investigadores puertorriqueños, tales como la doctora María Elba Torres, el artista curador Edwin Vázquez Collazo, entre otros, están creando conciencia sobre la negritud en Puerto Rico. Algunos resultados son el proyecto Tiznando el País, la exhibición Puerto Rico Negre, Casa Afro y Casa Silvana. Se muestra un patrón en la mayoría de los museos que visité, ya sean permanentes o temporeros, es que las exhibiciones presentaban la cultura negra usando imaginería popular, enfatizando el mestizaje, la música y el arte. No obstante, estas exhibiciones no tocaban el, centra, el tema central de ser negro o las complejidades de la negritud o las identidades puertorriqueñas. Algunas excepciones que pude observar fueron la Casa Afro en Luis y Casa Silvana en Humata, 
o Macao, que fueron museos específicos para contrarrestar esta falta de información y además algunas exhibiciones que fueron parte del proyecto Disneyland del País, que es para crear conciencia sobre este, la realidad en Puerto Rico sobre el tema de la negritud. Esto, esta experiencia que obtuve mirando museos, leyendo tesis, pues me dio a emerger nuevas preguntas. ¿Cómo silenciando el pasado? El, afecta la imagen de las personas negras en Puerto Rico. ¿Qué rol juega las instituciones a la hora de definir el arte puertorriqueño? Pues mientras leía me di cuenta que la mayoría de instituciones que surgieron durante el siglo XIX y XX estaban compuestas de personas que mostraban pues, las exhibiciones de acuerdo a un tema o de acuerdo a una institución. Y pues de acuerdo a ellos, pues eso eran los, los artistas que producían sus obras. ¿Cuáles son las limitaciones de los artistas negros o afrodescendientes de Puerto Rico para exponer sus obras? Pues me percaté también observando que fueron varios de los artistas que noté que pude reconocer que eran artistas afrodescendientes en su obra. O también cuando preguntaba a varias personas sobre si tenían temas centrales de sobre la negritud, no sabían cómo decirme o cómo contrarrestar esto. Eh, muchas gracias. Aquí termina mi presentación. Oh, trying to get rid of that echo. Yeah. Okay. Is that Amazing. Better? Yes. Oh my gosh, we got rid of that. No more echo. <laughs> Election day, something had to go. Is this is the worst that happened to me. Where's the, do you know where the next presentation is? Yeah, I have no idea. I, I, I ¿Te vas a quedar allá o vas a venir por acá? ¿Vas a venir por acá? Sí, yes, right. right. perfecto. Okay. All right, hello. I'm not Fernanda, but I'm introducing Fernanda. I'm Dr. Feltz's advisor, and it's a pleasure to serve in that capacity. And I've also had the, the fortune of working with Fernanda in the field in Mexico in the context of an archaeological uh, project and an excavation and in the lab. So I'm very excited to be able to introduce her. Um, Fernanda is a student in our PhD program in anthropology who is specializing in the archaeology of Mesoamerica with a particular focus on central Mexico. She earned her master's degree last year, and she is currently developing plans for her dissertation project, which will examine the ritual use and cultural significance of portable incense burners in pre-Hispanic Mexico. And this is a very under-investigated area in material culture, so we're really excited to see the results of her research. And um, thanks to support from the Tinker Nave Summer Field Research Program, she was able to spend this summer in Mexico City in the area of Mexico City, also in Teotihuacan and outlying areas, working on the preliminary stages of her project. So she, today she'll tell us about those activities and share some of the outcomes of her research. So let's please give her a warm welcome. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, as Dr. Clayton said, my name is Fernanda Hernandez. Um, I am a student here in archaeology, and today I'll be talking to you about uh, my interest in my dissertation, um, which is related to the 
use of incense burners in ritual contexts um, in central Mexico. But I will be discussing a little bit about some of the um, activities that I did in the field, um, some stuff that I've come across that has helped me uh, maybe develop it a little bit better and just sort of a good general overview about why this is important and what the future um, holds for my research. All right, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my advisor, um, Dr. Sarah Clayton, my co-advisor, Dr. Jonathan Knoyer, um, Lassus, of course, for the opportunity, and the Tinker Nate Foundation, who, of course, I would not have done this research with um, without their help. Um, UNAM, and especially the Institute of Anthropological Investigation, um, Agustin Ortiz, for providing me with just incredible resources and um, being incredibly welcoming uh, and supportive. And of course, my graduate work, cohort, who is um, some of them are here as well for their support. Yeah. So I expected, you know, people to know where Mexico is, but just in case, <laughs> uh, I like to put maps. Um, so we have Mexico and I'm focusing on central Mexico. That does include several states, but I am particularly interested in the basin and the valley and how a lot of that spread um, of, of items and cultural uh, practices spread around that basin and then maybe beyond. Um, so we're looking at some key sites here. We have um, Teotihuacan, which is one area that I am going to talk about later. We have Cerro Portezuelo, which uh, we also have plenty of samadores to discuss from that area. Just the general region is very important. There's a lot, a lot of interaction um, in this area as far as the epiclassic to the postclassic period, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, Tlaxcala is the state. Cholula is um, in Puebla. And the rest of the sort of outskirts are the state of Mexico. This outline is Mexico, what we consider Mexico City today. All right, so I'm assuming not everybody knows what a salmador is right at the top of their head. So I'm gonna kind of break down to you what this little piece um, is and why it's so significant. So incense burners, generally known as incensarios in Spanish. Um, this specific incensario is known as the might which means Mano de Fuego in Nahuatl. Um, and the Nahuatl is the uh, language of the Mexica people, the Aztecs, but also a various cultural group within the basin. Um, the Salmadores are called Salmar, which is to smoke. So Salmador means a smoker, right? Um, they are also called fatal sensors, portable sensors, frying pan sensors, et cetera, because you get to see the shape here. Um, it is this, sort of a uh, bowl, right? You have a bowl that kind of looks like a ladle, hence later, or a pan or a frying pan. Uh, you have the, the handle and you always have this little interesting uh, kind of bow right before you get to the end of the handle. And you always typically have, especially in post-classic, we see a lot of really interesting decorations at the end, um, both zoomorphic and anthropomorphic figures. So we'll get into a little bit of some of those significant pieces of the Samador and how we observe their changes um, from the epiclassic to later. Okay, so my research questions are, uh, they follow each other and they're essentially encompassing the idea of how can we tell what, how uh, some of those were used and why. Um, we know a lot about ritual. We know about a lot about Mesoamerican religion we know uh, that it was integrated, right? I can't say I can't say domestic ritual activities versus, um, you know, ritual temple activities. Ritual was embedded in everyday life and everything that you did. Um, and to give thanks, you would smoke, you would provide incense to the gods. So it's very, very much implemented in everyday life, and that's what I want to know. Archaeology is a lot oftentimes focus on big temples and, and ritualistic centers, and we want to know about the elite and the royals. But I think we forget that the mass, uh, the people, everyday people made up uh, that society as well, and that their activities have left a big mark. Um, so when were these samadores used and why, right? I want to know what are these contexts in which they're being used in domestic contexts. We do find them in households, specific areas of household potentially being dedicated daily through to, um, to a deity, to a god, et cetera, or in a non-domestic view. So we have very specific rituals continuously happening throughout the year 
both cyclical, calendrical, and for healing rituals, so like tamaskalis also help, fertility rituals, both for perhaps harvests or for women, um, and cleansing rituals, which is something that Copal essentially does. It cleanses the space to make it sacred. Who were involved in these processes as well, right? There's, um, there's a, a role that gender has to play in these activities from the stage of production to the eventual execution of a ritual. What are these gender roles and how are they important? Why are they um, associated to those activities, et cetera? So we get a little bit more insight into that social structure as well, apart from the cultural materials. Um, what materials were incorporated into these burnings um, and their role and significance? So copal will most likely be used throughout any burning. It's the sort of core um, element that you need. It's the resin, the pine resin, but there are different pine resins throughout Mexico. So is it golden? Is it black? Which were used when, et cetera. Um, we also have traced blood um, through auto sacrifice on some of these um, materials and tobacco. So these are just three sort of major materials that we see, but they are abundant. Um, and of course, do pigments and, and colors prevent these burnt chemicals from penetrating the clay and preserving those contexts? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the experiment that I did last year or last semester and, um, and I'll tell you how I got to this question. And of course, um, how does the contemporary use of samodores? So today, how do people use samodores and do they reflect any type of pattern that we see in the past? Um, if not, what are the, some of those uh, factors that contributed to these changes? All right, I am going about this in a multi-method approach. I have a lot, a lot of work to do still, uh, but I want to go about it in a way that not a lot of archeologists do. So I'm starting from modern day and I'm working my way back to the past. I want to start with an ethnographic um, study on modern day practitioners of um, traditional medicine or those that use salmadores um, today in, in the modern context. I'm gonna go into the ethno-historical uh, perspectives that we see through the ethno-history and uh, pictographic manuscripts. I'm gonna talk about the material analysis that I'm able to uh, do thanks to some of these laboratories and potential collaborators in the future that allow me to get these pieces and some of the um, institutions that have allowed me to go in. Um, and at the end, um, and a, a little bit about organic residue and fingerprint analysis. Um, not too much yet. That's that's probably going to be the end of the project. But I'm going to tell you how that's going to help um, us understand a little bit more about their ancient practices. All right, starting today, and I think this was a really good um, kind of initial discussion because we just had the other los muertos, right? Um, so this year. There was a commemoration for the establishment of the ancient capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, in Mexico City. I was really happy that I was there. This is an enormous thing. I've never seen it before. I'm, I'm from Mexico my City myself, so I'd never seen something like that. Uh, There's this huge, enormous celebration all around me where incense, incense, incense everywhere. And I was like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. So much notes. And I took a lot of notes. Uh, what you mostly see is this woman. Uh, typically, a lot of people now will will use a sensor and just clean you, right? There's no really depth into what exactly they're gonna do. They're cleansing you from bad spirits, from bad energies, et cetera. Now I do wonder, because I don't have the interview questions or our appearance yet, I would have liked to ask, well, um, why do you get to do this? Can I also get the some other into it to somebody else? You know, so I'd like to go into depth a little bit uh, with communities, more specific communities that still practice this. But these are some examples of how these items, these very, very ancient items are still very prevalent in our society today and how they're 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 um, reinforcing cultural heritage through these uses. Um, we also, I, I, and I'm very interested in seeing the syncretic um, nature of the indigenous and colonial or European and Spanish um, ideas and practices being, being created into one, which is when I found this quote, I thought it was really interesting to think about because most people look at Day of the Dead and they'll be like, well, it's a pre-Hispanic, uh, pre-Columbian uh, tradition, but they don't recognize that there's a lot of syncretism and hybridity in there that was brought up by the Spanish. Um, we, we see the type of sensor. I want you to know the type of sensors that I put up here. This one's more kind of like a cup, right? This one has does have a traditional ladle on the side and handle. And then this is just some of these uh, 
type of um, um, tours and, and events that happen in Mexico about medicine women, about people practicing traditional medicine or forms of medicine, herbolaria, uh, uh, right, dances, you see the involvement of Salvadores uh, there and all of these type of activities. All right, so now you see that the one of the ladies had the sensor with the handle, and the other one was kind of like a cup, right, standing up. We see those cups start transforming um, into that shape. And um, so I'll come over here. Uh, right here we have one from Puebla, so which is the Cholula area that I showed you. And then these two are from Michoacan. These are modern sensors, though. We get to see the shape and how they've it's changed over time. Nonetheless, they're still being used relatively the same. Um, in the future, I hope to uh, uh, meet with this man again. He was kind enough. I met him in an artisan market in Totihuacan. Um, he showed me a picture of him working on a sensor in his shop and offered to give me a, you know, to to you know be of service if I needed him. So I thought I'd give him some credit, um, and hopefully, I'll get to do some research. With him. All right, I took a trip down to the Archivo General. This summer, um, is my official badge. I felt really proud. Um, <laughs> felt really official. It was the best day of my life so far. <laughs> I went there expecting to find, I don't know, in my head, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get all of it, right? Uh, but no, actually, I came upon other uh, records. Um, I was looking for discussion of Samadores or production. I don't know, maybe there's documentation on that, right? Instead, I came up on records of donated items, bought items, claims, and reports of illegal use of Samadores. So now I'm looking at Samadores being um, demonized and, wow, big changes. Yeah. So, um, so I thought that was really interesting because that's going to fill in some of the gaps that I'm going to see when we end, right, the 1519 into the uh, post-classic, into the class period, uh, sorry, the colonial period, where all these changes come about. Um, where people are either being really resilient, hiding the practices, right? That's what I want to know. I want to know how these people were able to maintain these practices for so long, even, even when there's big, big um, there's a chasing after these people who are continuing their practices. Also, there are reports of some of those being found in farms and different areas. So there's no context to them. They're just items that were donated. And I'd like to see a little bit more about these items because they're in places really, really Kind of key we have um a pieza the um pieza arqueológica de Huaca. that's a really really important site um and etc so i was not expecting this but i think um it definitely added a uh, new context and more questions to my already a lot of questions okay all right so a little bit about the ethno history um we have the codices pictographic codices and we have uh spanish friars and um, uh, people recording the events of uh, the conquest of Mexico. But before that, um, the Aztecs and other societies built, um, created their own sort of documentation, which a lot of them were burnt, but we have very few left. Some of these native accounts and pictographic manuscripts um, give us a really, really beautiful detailed insight into how how they practice their practices, right? So we have here a temple with an image. You have um, people right here is a salmador. There it is, firing stuff. Uh, he's probably blowing the smoke. Uh, there's more salmadores up there. I believe this is a needle and there's blood there too. There might, ah, yeah, his shin is bleeding. So practicing out of sacrifice. The smoke is there going right into that wound, right? So we have these, we have the, um, we have Tudela, a number of number of codices depicting all of these ritual activities. Mostly a lot of them in temples, but um, there are some depicted in households, etc. However, ethno history is a little bit tricky. Um, we know that people that write history are typically always the ones um, to bring in their bias and apply sort of their perspective on what the events were. But um, things like the discovery and conquest of Mexico by Bernal Diaz de Castillo. He does mention, um, like this quote says, there were some brazers with incense, which they talk about, and in them they were burning the hearts of the Indians who they had sacrificed that day. 
and they have made sacrifices with smoke and Gopal. So we know Gopal is associated with smoke. We know they're interconnected because it's religious ideology. Um, this is a, a, a nice phrase, a, a nice sort of um, depiction of what's happening. But if you read more of, the, of this book, if you go about discovery and conquest, you start seeing a little bit of patterns of term terminology, the way that they approach some of these events. So it's always good to be very cautious when we um, analyze some of these you know, historical pieces. Um, so I, I do always highlight um, either native people's uh, uh, approaches um, before any of the um, colonial, colonial accounts. Okay. These were some of the items that I came about this uh, summer. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have me in Teotihuacan. This is a research laboratory by the University of California at Riverside. Um, one of our, our good, great um, workers from the field also uh, works there and uh, I was around and he offered to show me the tour and I am holding up a coarse mat three prong sen uh, burner. I'm sorry, Brenner. Uh, I'm just looking at the variation in their in their pace, etc. Um, so it was really good good time to walk around, talk to a lot of people, um, make connections. That's really a big part of of this is to make connections and get um, potential collaborators. Um, so that's that's one of the key things that I was doing. I was also looking around for potential materials that I can analyze, um, and these right here are essentially the reason why I got into this whole deal. These are probably some of the most beautiful pieces or some other days that I've ever seen. I've tried recreating one on my own and you'll see it, it looks nothing like that. Um, so as I did it, I recognized that there's like a high level of skill and craftsmanship that goes into making these items and even more with the painting and with the incisions and with decoration is just truly remarkable. And I'd like to give those credit. I'd like to highlight their not only their contribution to the ritual life, but also to the people that made them and the people that practice them every day. Um, but you can see that they're highly pigmented, right? They're really nice. And I, have, and I doubt somebody's gonna let me go in and break them up to test on, but I do have a potential way to do that. Let's go on to the next. All right, so those are the post-classic Salmadores. They're the sort of the ending period of the Aztec empire. Um, they're highly elaborated. They all have um, either stands or no stands. That's something that I was looking at is the attributes of these pieces. Are they hollow or some not hollow? Some do have rattles. Um, some are directly open like this. Others have this like unfolding like there. That is a Cholula polychrome. Um, that one has an eagle uh, claw at the end of it. And I tried to do one of those, went wrong, but you can see that they did it quite well. And when we think about ritual activities in Mesoamerica, we know that their ideologies are always embedded in their materials, right? Because it's all interconnected. So there you're gonna see those in the material record, right? So we have a samador there with a the claw, but we also see it in another, in another sculpture, as you can see A up there, it's a representation. Uh, it's actually a handle of another samador. And then we have them depicted in different codices, right? So then we can start to analyze what are the, what are the patterns here? Why? Why are certain forms of samadores only have zoomorphic figures at the end and only certain ones have hands or anthropomorphic figures? So that's kind of where uh, uh, I'm going to start making my way, um, hopefully soon. It's just really diving into the different samadores and their depictions in the codices or different um, manuscripts that we have, looking at their symbolic uh, interpretations and um, significance that could tell us potentially a lot more about the people that were practicing it and how they believed um, that the world was, was uh, intertwined um, through these animals we have. This is a snake of, uh, no, sorry, a uh, fire snake. There's there's water snakes, there's earth snakes. So there's even a variation of snake heads within these samadores. Uh, these little uh, sort of uh, triangular holes in there, these orifices are used to let the the oxygen flow in and let the smoke kind of continue, right? Um, we see those actually later in like Catholic incense burners too. They have those similar holes. That's kind of their purpose. Um, earlier pieces do not have those uh, holes in there. They have different um, styles, but that's kind of where the idea is to look at the different attributes through time. 
Right. So, so here are the earlier versions, right? These are early, these are epic classic Samadores from about 16 to 900 AD. We have uh, a period um, which we call Coyotlatelco, which is a type of style and form of a Samador. So you can see those there. They're a lot more simple, right? They all either either have a handle, don't have a handle, or to hollow, not hollow, etc. Um, but we start seeing these types of samadores, meaning the ones with the ladles appear pretty early um, in the epic classic. And then maybe, maybe even in the late classic period, we saw a form of those in the Montalban region. Where I came up across this uh, in a dissertation and I thought that was really interesting. I had not come across early classic period samadores, but I'm glad there is. Maybe there's more back I can go to. Um, and then uh, we have some really simple samadores here. But I want you to look at the burn, uh, sort of the burn, I don't know if you can see it, but the burn in here um, is very evident. However, not very evident up here. So I'm not really sure if they did any burning up here, right? So I'm also looking at the absorption and maybe the the, the signs of potential um, absorption in there. Uh, so I'm considering maybe testing a piece like this, right? A piece like this will maybe give me some good residue analysis let me know what was being burned, et cetera. Um, but in a piece like the post-classic ones, which has a layer of pigment on it, maybe several layers of pigment on them, um, may give me a, sort of a problem as far as like, it may prevent clay uh, or the burning materials from seeping into the clay. Where here, there's no pigment, there's nothing obstructing the clay from absorbing any of those materials. So, put that question. And I did a little experiment. Um, I tried to make my own little ladle sensor there. It's a miniature form. Um, and I burned some pieces myself, right? So I burned um, tobacco, copal, white copal, uh, tobacco, and uh, some yeltli flowers. Um, and I also put some pine wood in there just to create the, the, the to get the fire going. I did this and I realized, right, where you see that middle part where everything's burned. The middle part is actually not burned at all. The places that that are that kind of carry most of that smoke and, and those materials are gonna be on the walls on the sides. Um, and depending and also depends how much how much are they burning, right? How how long are they burning these things for? So so I have I had to start considering how long are they burning these pieces? Is one continuous piece being burned forever, et cetera? This is sort of where my project's gonna take off uh, a little bit later, but I do want to start um, maybe considering that uh, the residue analysis will be able to tell us in conjunction with the ethnohistory and the ethnography, um, how these items were used, right? A lot of these carry uh, uh, chemical traces such as blood or for, from fermented drinks. Those carbohydrates are gonna give us that. Proteins as well, fatty acids and phosphates are really, really common. Um, and studies of residue analysis on some of those. And we can see that that's, that's valid. We see these very elements also um, being represented in the ethnography and in the ethnohistory. Um, so I'm just planning to hopefully bring us all together. And once I do, I will be back to let you know. So thank you so much. Great. So unfortunately, just because we have a slow start, we're not going to really have time for questions probably because I want to make sure that Mariana has enough time to present. Um, but I, I would assume um, the presenters would be happy to answer questions probably by email if you guys have things you wanted to ask. And Tanadi, I do apologize for the echo. I'm sorry that was taking place during your presentation. So sorry about that. Um, so our third presenter today is Mariana Sarkis Olson. Um, she is a Brazilian historian who studies Latin America and early modern Iberian history, emphasizing the colonial period in New Spain or present-day Mexico. She's in her second year as a PhD student in the history department, mm -hmm. and her research areas are colonialism, family history, legal history, and Atlantic history. Today, she will present the intimate lives of unmarried families in the 18th century New Spain. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so yeah, I would like to thank you, Lasses uh, program for warming with the Tinker Navin grant, also the Tinker Navy Foundation, um, also Alberto Vargas for his leadership here in Lasses, and also Sada for your amazing support. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, so as a historian, my research projects team from questions that remain unexplored in the literature on family history in early Latin America, especially between the 17th and 18th century New Spain, present day Mexico. So when individuals came together to form nucleus of intimacy, cohabitation and kingship, during the colonial period without the recognition of Catholic Church, these arrangements were classified as concubinage, amancebamiento, illicit unions, amistad illicita, and among other terms. So these were ways to stereotype these families and frequently appear in notario, judicio, and in ecclesiastical documentation. Rather than continue to perpetuate these stereotypes so commonly employed by historiography, my large research project explored how these unmarried couples position themselves as a family and integrate members across boundaries of race, class, and gender. So my preliminary research on these unmarried families led me to examine a set of judicial process on the ecclesiastical court of the Servispado de Mexico in Mexico City. So during the 18 and 17th and 18th century, uh, numerous government and moral reforms uh, happened and this ecclesiastical courts act as an institution meant to persecute, uh, meant to prosecute families for the crime of and I approach this course's cases to recover unmarried litigants' voices. So how did these individuals position themselves as a family or invoke their vulnerability? How did they produce knowledge and ideas about definition of family? And how did their domestic units emerge from and shaped the neighborhoods of Mexico City. So what did their intimate daily look like? So this is one or a couple of my, some of my central questions. So the documentation produced by the Ecclesiastical Court has not been digitized or it is complied into a single collection in the Archivo General de la Nación, AGN in Mexico. Instead, these cases are dispersed across several collections at the AGN, such as Bien Nacionales, Matrimonios, Independiente Virreinal, among others. So my time in Mexico this last summer lasts 42 days. These were days during the highest record of a heat wave in Mexico City. <laughs> days when the archive, especially AGN, maybe Fernanda remembers that, was closed during the power outages. There were days when my entire list of reference could not be consulted because the documents were in poor condition or unavailable for consultation due with technical procedures. So days when I got ill, days when the street were blocked for the presidential election campaign, and days when I was most joyful having found cases, I didn't expect a long, long hours in the reading rooms. So my time in Mexico was also enriched by the guidance of Professor Rodolfo Aguirre in La Unan, Jessica Ramirez in El Colegio de Mexico, and the warm hospitality of Professor Cecilia Habel, who welcomed me to her home for conversations about the directions my research could take. So technical and bureaucratic obstacles and procedures are part of historians' research, and I will be happy to share with you many polls of the ones that I encountered last summer. So my trip to Mexico this past summer was full of lessons on where and how 
to find um, judicial cases of unmarried family. For instance, at a Archivo Historico del Arcebispado, I understood that the Episcopal Archive was nationalized and mostly sent to Arreni. Nonetheless, I consulted some books from the Secretary of the Profesorado, which was the Ecclesiastical Court, which contained brief anecdotes about family situations that could or could not proceed to become a formal court cases. And these are example of this type of books. Um, so these books are fascinating documents for understanding how ecclesiastical justice sought to resolve the informed cases or the informed status of these families, often through dispensas or exceptions for illicit unions. This means some cases never proceed or receive formal sentences because the parish priest was instructed to resolve the matter through admonestaciones and confesiones. My research also led me to the um, historical archive of Mexico City and the historical archive of the Minister of Health. So it's the Archivo Histórico de la Secretaría de la Salud, el Archivo Histórico de la Ciudad de México, and el Archivo Histórico de Arzobispado de México. However, it was in the ARN, Archivo General de la Nación, where I found most of the cases I will continue to analyze during this, uh, this research. I created a database with approximately um, 380 potential cases from which I could photograph about 180 this summer. So the number of pages per file um, can vary greatly, greatly, and still in such cases, I ensure that it involves judicial action civil or ecclesiastical where individuals want to engage in intimate situation of a uh, Organize, I organize these readings, the reading of these documents to the notion system where I create a summary sheets. Initially, I focus on central information such as the names of those involved, where they live, the length of the relationship, where they had children, and details about race and social classes. So one of examples of these cases I'm gonna share with you guys today. So in 7080, Maria Cristina Estefania Serrano submitted a petition to the Ecclesiastical Court of Mexico City. She claimed to be mestiza, single, born and raised in Mexico City, and 25 years old. Maria used her status of legitimate daughter and her role as a servant in the household of Don Domingo Rodriguez to argue that she was an honest person. The main reason for her petition was to transfer Vicente Flores, who was in prison by the Real Audiencia, a civil court, to the prison to the ecclesiastical court. So Vicente had been detained for cohabitate with the petition. This request suggests that Maria knew or had help um, in requesting that ecclesiastical institution handle her case, having handle her case, sorry, as the core of her argument was that Vicente's only crime was his intention to marry her heaven promise marriage. So I believe that her strategy made sense as later in the case, and the case was compiled inside of this file, inside of this book. Um, ecclesiastical notaries investigate whether both intend to marry and had no impediments for formalizing their intimate relationship before the ecclesiastical court. So additionally, by standing that Vicente had promised marriage, Maria likely hoped that he could be released as soon as possible from jail. She was determined to free Vicente from prison and the ecclesiastical court took up the case. 
So the priest Jose Oribe and the notario um, court Juan Francisco de Lara went to the prison to verify this information with Vicente Flores, who was 21 years old, claimed to be Spanish and a legitimate son. And Vicente confirmed that he had promised to marry Maria. On the same day, the priest Uribe and the notario interrogate Maria, who provide a evidence of Vicente's promise, a testimony card that she claimed to have seen Vicente write it. However, Vicente had not signed his own testimony early that day, saying that he did not know how to write. So the priest signed it from him. And I found um, this paper annexed to the court case. And it was, it is pretty rare to find something like this. Even in the moment that I found it, the archivist on the reading room, they stopped and they came to see what exactly I have found it. And it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it is different. And it's definitely save it into, into the process. And Vicente is saying, Digo yo, Vicente, José Vicente Flores, que estando en mi entero juicio, en mi última voluntad le doy palabra de casamento a Dona María Cristina Serrano, por lo que pongo por testigo, Dios, nuestro Señor, el la Santísima Virgen, Santo Ángelo de mi guarda, por lo que lo doy esta cédula, testimonio de verdad, a los días 24 de marzo de 1780. So, the case proceed with witnesses testimony. And it's interesting to note that the four witnesses were men who had known both individuals since childhood, except for one. All of them lived in the same neighborhood as Maria and Vicente, Polebo de la Leña, in la parish, in the parish of the Secretario in Mexico City. Using neighborhood tides in this testimony is essential for understanding the formation of kingship bonds. And it is also illustrate how race overlap with occupation and residential ties in the selection of the witnesses. Among the witnesses, it was a Pardo Libre, a Indio Zapatero, a Mestizo Taylor, and just one Mestizo who could read and write. All of the witnesses rely on long-standing ties with Maria and Vicente. They confirmed that both were single and knew of no reasons why they could not marry. They testified to an intimacy from childhood with considerable familiarity, letting me to think they might have formed a social network despite differences of state status or ethnicity. Moreover, the investigation conducted by the notario and the priest exemplified that at that point, the crime of a mancebamiento seemed less relevant than, provide, than proving that both Maria and Vincent had a sincere intention to formalize their relationship. What was more interesting, what was more significant concern to the tribunal's offices was the crime of perjury, as this could lead to other consequences, such as excommunication or the annulment of the marriage. They testified that they did not know whether the perjury was committed by Vicente, who may have lied about not knowing how to write, or by Maria, who claimed to have seen to have seen Vicente write the promise. Somehow, in the following months, Vicente managed to leave the prison, and the process seems to have no reasons to delay it any further. So it was unknown whether Maria and Vicente were convinced of perjury, when and if the formalization of the relationship took place, Nevertheless, this case is an example of how cases involving cohabitant individuals provide a rich material for 
an analysis to moves that moves beyond the dichotomy between legitimate, illegitimate, mestizos, hijos, mestizas, hijas, and raise other questions about the role of women and initiate legal actions. The formation of kingship to the choices of witnesses, the strategies to ensure people's security, transferring Vincent from one prison to another one, and to have their demands attended. Through analyzing these cases, I hope one day my work will enable us to pose new questions about the complexity of domesticity and intimacy in this unmarried arrangement in early colonial Mexico. So thank you so much for your attention and I would like to